Hey, my name's Graham Jones, and I want to welcome you to my online teaching ministry. Please consider hitting the subscribe button or checking out the links below. Hey, for the next few days, I'm going to be bringing you a snippet every day, just a piece of the teaching from my new online course, The Goodness Course. What is The Goodness Course? Well, in 12 lessons, we just explore the transformational power of goodness. The Bible says we should be wise in that which is good and literally foolish or simple concerning evil. And I think the body of Christ I think there's a revolution coming when we realize how good God is, but also that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. If you think about Peter, God, Jesus showed him, the Lord through Jesus showed him his immense goodness when he nearly sank his boat with fish, Luke chapter five. And Peter's reaction was, depart from me, I am a sinful man. And then he left everything and followed Jesus. And I think there's something about God's goodness which turns hearts around. So often in the body of Christ, we're looking at our world and we're calling out for judgment. But what we should be doing is saying, get near us and taste and see that the Lord is good. So I, I think this course is really, really important. Some of the truths I share here have transformed my life and I believe they'll do the same for you. So let's jump into a, a snippet, a little taster of this each day. If you're interested in getting the course, there'll be a link below. Uh, sign up online there. If you can't afford the cost of it, just let me know what you can afford. We're not here to make money, we're here to get the Word of God out in front of people. Folks, welcome to the Goodness Course. I pray this material is blessing you. Um, and I. Really pray that you'll meet and encounter the good God in the midst of this. You know, my goal in this course is not simply that you would get information, rather that becomes revelation. And revelation begats experience. Um, Moses, well, the Lord said it to Moses in this way, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong unto us. And then he spoke about inheritance in the same verse. He said, the things that God reveals belong to you, but also to your children and your children's children. And I believe God wants to establish literally a, a ministry of his goodness in our life. He wants to establish that testimony. So we've tasted and seen. Come on, I encourage you to write down those two words, to taste and to see. If you want to see the goodness of God, you need to taste the goodness of God. If you're gonna taste the goodness of God, you've got to believe in that goodness. And I believe God wants us to be like these, um, forgive the analogy, but like these Holy Ghost lollipops, these tasting stations. So everywhere we go, people get near our lives and are attracted or notice the goodness of God in our lives. You know, Genesis 20, let's see, 26, you don't need to go there, but there was a, it's the time of Isaac. Abraham had died, Isaac now is a leader, the patriarch, if you will, of the uh, family that would become the uh, tribe of Israel, the nation of Israel. And uh, in Genesis 26, there was a famine in the land and nobody could grow anything. And uh, the Bible says all the peoples of the land, you know, that would be the land of Canaan, went down to Egypt to buy food. And Isaac was about to go down to Egypt to buy some food too. And God said to him, wait, he said, stay in the land in a famine, sow your seed and I'll bless you. And while everybody else went down to Egypt, Isaac sowed his seed in the land and reaped a hundredfold. And at the end of the passage, it says the Philistines came to him and were jealous. <laughs> I love that. I think God wants our lives to make people jealous, not in a bad way, but in a provoking way. You know, it's really interesting. We spoke about Moses um, saying, show me your glory. And God says, okay, I'll pass my goodness before your eyes. The Apostle Paul says that God is going to provoke the Jews to jealousy when they see the glory that is upon the Gentile church. Hmm. Yeah, what does that look like? I don't even know, but I believe we're going to see it in the days and years to come. With the glory of God, what's glory? The ma I will pass my goodness before your eyes. The glory of God, the manifest goodness of God is seen and is tasted, if you will, on our lives. And again, the goodness of God will lead men to repentance. Good. Well, today, in today's lesson, I've entitled this God the Good, <laughs> Jehovah the Good. God, goodness is not um, 
a hobby of God. It's not simply one of his attributes. It's a core characteristic. It's who he is. The Lord is good. Let me read a couple of scriptures to begin with. John 10 verse 10, Jesus says, The thief, Satan, the enemy, comes not but to kill, steal, and to steal, kill, and destroy. Let us put those the wrong way around. But he says, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Hmm. I think it's Bill Johnson who simplifies that verse and says, God good, devil bad. God good, devil bad. God good, devil bad. Have you got it yet? And it's really that simple. You can draw a line throughout history, throughout your history, throughout the whole world and say, God is good. Satan is not good. So God is good. Everything else outside of God lacks his goodness. Exodus 34 verse 6 says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth. So let's jump into today's lesson. So again, we've said the basic truth of all is that God is good. The very core DNA of God is his goodness. And everything we ever see of God, you know, at times there are things where we, it appears um, that he's being harsh, the, the judgment, we see other points. But at the bottom of those things is always every strand of God's, oh God doesn't have DNA. You understand what I'm saying? Of God's core characteristics is he is good. He's a God of goodness. He is a God of mercy. And God is relentless and God is passionate in his goodness. Mm. There's a... There's a um, a biblical word, a, a Jewish word, a Hebrew word, hasid, H-E-S-E-D. And it's sometimes translated loving kindness, sometimes translated goodness, tender mercies. It's really a covenant word, though. It's a word that was used when two parties came together and made a covenant and that they would have this promise, this literally an inheritance promise that would go down to other generations to help and support and do good for each other. You know, really marriage is like that. When two people come together and um, have this relentless, passionate desire to do the other person good, to serve, to bless, to love, marriage works. Whenever two people come together in a relationship, basically saying, what do I get out of this? What does this do for me? How does this meet my needs? Um, neither person gets their needs met. There was a time when David, King David, made a covenant with uh, King Saul's son, Jonathan. He literally cut a blood covenant with him. And of course, later on, Jonathan dies. And uh, much later in life, David, when he's now king, he's established, he finds out that, uh, that Jonathan had a son called Mephibosheth, who has been, is living in a horrible place in Israel called Lodi Bar, a swampland. And, uh, and David talks about, he's kind of burning with this hasid, this loving kindness, this desire to bless, this desire to do good for his covenant friend. And of course, his covenant friend Jonathan isn't even around anymore, but he wants to do good to the seed of Jonathan, to the, the son of Jonathan. I want you to see that today, that God is relentless in his goodness. God looks at your life and mine, and his desire is to bless. Everything that comes from God is good. When God created a garden, he created everything. You see these parallels, these, this dualism all the way through the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the sun and the moon, the day and the night, the sea and the dry land, the man and the woman. That's why there's only two genders, by the way. And everything God made, what did God say? It was good. Everything God made, God came, analyzed it, looked at it and said, it was good. And of course, then the thief comes, steal, kill and destroy. And yet when you read the very end of the book, when God restores everything, everything will be brought back to that wonderful um, place of goodness. Good. You know, so we want to, I haven't written in my notes, so we'll experience God in, we'll experience God in the measure of our knowledge of him. So the key here is that we, we need our hearts established 
in those truths. Uh, what does it mean to be established? We, the danger is we can have a truth that we think we believe, we believe, and then one little thing can throw us off course. At times, our house of understanding of God's goodness can be like the house that's built on the sand that looks good when the weather's good in the summer, but then when the rain comes and the wind blows and the storm beats, that house falls. So God really wants our hearts to be absolutely established in his goodness. Um, as I've said in a previous le uh, lesson, I believe the Lord wants to use literally all the events of life, the different things we walk through to mentor us, to show us his goodness. Uh, but I think we've if we want our hearts established in this, how do we do that? We pray and we say, Lord, show me what I really truly do believe about you. I think if we want our hearts established in this, we need to allow God to rewrite some of the script, some of the core beliefs that we may have about God. You know, it's an interesting thing. I've noticed this over the years, that there, are, there is an attractiveness in condemnation. Hmm. There is a glory still attached, a chat, attached. Let me fix these teeth. There is a glory still attached, Paul says in Second Corinthians three, to the ministry of condemnation. I once heard Eric Clapton, <laughs> not in the Bible, but uh, talk about writing a blues song, and he said he wanted to write a. He wrote a blues song called "Wonderful Tonight," and he made the comment that it's very easy to write a negative song to write a song where everything's going wrong and I'm complaining, but actually it's hard to write something where everything is good. And, you know, it's interesting in, uh, in my experience of looking at the church, it's very easy for somebody to rise up in a local church or, you know, the internet and to begin judging others. How many times have we heard somebody say, the problem with the church is blah, 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 blah. And it may be true what they are saying, there may be some basis in what they're saying. What they're not really thinking of is they place themselves in the seat of judgment. I mean, if I were here, I'm in a church here that I lead here in Massachusetts. If I were to come in here and bang my fist, the problem with this church is bah, 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 bah. I may be completely right, but it's not helped anybody move forward. It hasn't re caused repentance or change. And uh, my point is, it's very easy to see what's wrong in somebody else. And the danger is we sit in the seat of the scornful. We take a seat of judgment, a place of judgment when we do that. And I believe God wants us, you and I, he wants the church to be living in a place of maturity where we, we do see what's wrong with the other. We do see, we're not blind to that. We're not naive. And yet we look at other people through the lens of God's goodness. We look at others through the lens of God's compassion and we say, Lord, how do you see this? How do you perceive this? Here? Well, thanks for watching this far. I hope you're enjoying this material. As I said earlier, what I'm sharing with you here, I approved, I put to the test and it's changed my life. I've seen it change the lives of others and I believe would be a blessing to you. Hey, if you're interested in uh, signing up for the course, again, check out the link below or go to ministryschool.net. Um, you know, if you can't afford that full course, tell us what you can afford and uh, we will work that out with you. But we want to get the material in front of you, in your heart and in your life. Again, if you're new to my video ministry, my traveling ministry, the churches I lead in New England, uh, check out some of the links below for more information. Sign up for our email newsletter. And do hit that subscribe button on YouTube or on our podcast uh, links. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll be back every day with more videos. Bye for now.